Turning now to the world of dance with our next guest who continues to break barriers, Misty Copeland made history as the first African-American female principal dancer with the prestigious American Ballet Theater. And she's now detailing her journey to the historic role and her relationship with the women who paved the way. It's in her new book, The Wind at My Back. And she joins Michelle Martin to discuss these achievements and of course her future in ballet as well. Thanks, Christiane. Mystique Copeland, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> now, I know you're a prima ballerina, but your story could be an opera. <laughs> I mean, I know that people who've seen you in all your glory on stage or people who've seen you in your magnificent finery at, at a red carpet would never know the story that brought you to this place. It's just a remarkable story growing up uh, in a really unstable fashion, uh, largely raised by a single mom, one of six siblings. You actually started ballet at an age when many kids have already been on point for years. I mean, you know, some kids start as early as three and you didn't even start ballet until you were 13. How did that happen? And yeah. how did you fall in love with ballet? My mother moved to California when I was just two years old with me and my siblings from Kansas City, Missouri, where I was born. Um, and it, it there was just constant moving. Um, I was in different schools and I became this very introverted shell of a person, um, not really if, having found my way of um, expressing myself and, and communicating because um, it was not verbally. I was really uncomfortable just speaking. Um, and it was around the time that my mother had recently remarried uh, her fourth husband mm -hmm. and um, we had settled in San Pedro, California, and I would become a member of the Boys and Girls Club of San Pedro, me and my siblings. It was a place where my mother could have us uh, go and um, and there was like a stable place for us to be after school. Um, you know, years being at the Boys and Girls Club, um, they never had dance there. Um, and it was at 13 years old that uh, the local ballet teacher in San Pedro came into the Boys and Girls Club looking for more diverse uh, students to give scholarships to and bring into her school. And I happened to be one of them. So I was pushed into taking this free ballet class on a basketball court at my Boys and Girls Club, wearing gym clothes, you know, I was not at all in the proper attire. Um, and it wasn't until, uh, you know, I took that first class, my teacher immediately identified that I was a prodigy. Um, that word meant nothing to me. It didn't really hold any weight, but it took a lot of coaxing to get me to the studio. Once I was in the studio was when I fell in love with it. There was something about the the rigor, the consistency, the stability, all the things I was craving in my life, ballet gave me um, this grace and uh, beauty. It was an escape and it was a way of expression that suited me and worked for me and and the rest is history <laughs> you, you know my i think it's maya angelo who said you can't be what you can't see mm. and at that point you would not have seen anyone really who no. looked like you but can you identify the moment at which you said to yourself this is something that i can do this is something that i love you know what's so interesting is that I immediately felt that with ballet. Mm -hmm. I I think that it was because of the support that I had. I had a teacher who was not a woman of color. She was a white Jewish woman, um, but had such a clear understanding um, uh, of what it meant for me to be in the ballet world as a black girl. Um, she protected me in a lot of ways from the racism that was happening around me and kind of guarded me from hearing and knowing what was going on. So I really had this incredible um, freedom to just be a student and not think about the things that most dancers of color are, are thinking about in, in, in the space of this very European white world. Um, it wasn't until I became a professional ballet dancer that it all hit me. So I am wondering when it is that you first got the message that there were people who did not believe that you belonged there. How was that message first communicated to you? I had an opportunity to uh, go as a guest artist 
um, when I was 15 years old to South Dakota <laughs> um, and dance with this small ballet company um, as the lead in the Nutcracker. Um, and I had learned this role, uh, gone, flew there with only a couple of days uh, before my first performance. And I was told that I had to pretend that I didn't know the choreography and that I was just there to audition for the lead. And it was very confusing for me. Everyone was really worried that bringing this black girl to this white school um, to dance the lead would have caused such an uproar that they wanted to feel out whether or not they were going to accept me um, and kind of make it look as though I was auditioning. Um, that was the first time that I'd experienced that type of response within the ballet community. Uh, but once I became a professional, these um, microaggressions and things that I would uh, read um, in reviews or just from dancers in the company, uh, board members, I would hear from staff members at American Ballet Theater that I shouldn't be performing in the Ballet Blancs, the white ballets. Um, these are um, in some of the most famous ballets. The second act is when the entire company, the corps de ballet and the lead dancers are all very uniform. They wear white tutus and um, all have similar complexion. And I was told that I would ruin the aesthetic. I would ruin the line um, by being a brown body amongst these white dancers um, in the ballet blanc uh, genre. I recognize that you've heard this for so many years that this is just part of what you had to deal with. But I think for people outside of the world of ballet, I think many people would find that just absolutely ridiculous and absurd. Why would people think that? Is it because sort of a European, a very specific European aesthetic was so embedded yes. in the ballet world that people didn't question it? Right. You know, it is now our art form as well. And we have to make adjustments because when you're performing in America, you know, uh, in order for the ballet to continue to stay relevant, to continue to grow, um, we have to see diversity on the stage and behind the scenes and in boardrooms um, in order for people to want to invest in it and, and want it to continue on. So, you know, we have a ways to go. And this has been my mission since I, you know, became a professional um, is educating uh, the black and brown community about what ballet is and the beauty of it, and then creating a space where they feel safe and that they can thrive um, within this space. One of the things though that I, I found interesting about your book is that um, it, it so encapsulates the experience of being the first and the only not just in the world of ballet, but in so many other fields. You were 10 years at the American Ballet Theater, and you were the only black woman in, in the company. And I wondered, what were you aware of it at the time? Did you feel this extra sense of having to persevere, even mm -hmm. in the difficult times? Because did you feel the weight of all those eyes on you as the first, the only, for so long? I would say I didn't really feel that until uh, the the year that I was promoted to principal dancer. <laughs> it was 15 years that I was a dancer in the company before I reached the, the rank of principal dancer. Um, and in that time, um, I just felt I understood my responsibility and it never felt like pressure or weight. Um, it, I was just proud to be in this position and I and I understood that I might not see another black woman come through this company in my lifetime. So I'm going to take every opportunity. I'm going to push through. But it wasn't until I, you know, all eyes were on me in terms of the media and my story getting out there beyond the ballet bubble um, and really crossing over into pop culture. But the, the, the narrative changed in that last year before I was promoted, you know, where it was like, um, is Misty getting these opportunities because she's black? If she gets promoted or if she doesn't execute these technical feats in these roles that she's getting the opportunity to dance, does she deserve to be a principal dancer? And that doesn't happen. There's no white dancer that experience, has experienced that. Um, you know, when I'm approaching roles for the first time and I have the New York Times, they're reviewing me and people writing about my performances, it became really overwhelming. And that was the first time that I really started to feel the pressure 
of what it meant to be in that position. One of the things that I learned from your book is literally two days after you launched one of the roles of your career in Firebird, you had to withdraw because you were grievously injured. Mm -hmm. You had, was it six stress fractures in your tibia? You knew how seriously injured you were, but you mm -hmm. went on anyway. Why? Um, you know, I, I understood that I had to be my own advocate because, you know, within the company being the only, um, I didn't have people, I, I didn't have the opportunity to keep making mistakes and, and get another opportunity. Um, I understood that getting this chance to, to perform the role of the firebird, this iconic role in a full length classical work as a black woman at 29 years old, which is like ancient and ballet age, <laughs> that if I didn't go on stage and I backed out because of an injury, there wasn't going to be a second chance. And so I knew that even if I just got on stage one time, it could completely change the perception of black women in ballet. It could give an opportunity to a young person who saw me on the stage and could see a future for themselves, whether or not it was ballet or whatever it is they want to do where in a space where they're told they can't. Um, I knew it was going to make an impact. So I, you know, it was seeing the line wrapped around the Met, you know, of black and brown people there to support me that got me through that performance. Once that adrenaline hit and I knew who was in the audience, um, the pain went away. Um, but of course, it all came rushing back as soon as the performance was over. And I knew that um, it might be the last performance I ever perform if I don't didn't go see a doctor. This is where I think the role of history and mentors come in because one of the few people who did know how seriously injured you were was your mentor Raven Wilkinson and you know I have to say her story along with yours is unbelievable how did you learn of her yeah Raven's journey has been incredible and she was really the first black woman to reach the rank of soloist um but I I learned of her watching a documentary on the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. Um, I was already a soloist at ABT, and, and sadly, I was not at all familiar with who she was. Um, I watched this long documentary, and towards the very end, this elegant, beautiful Black woman appeared on the screen and started speaking about her time in the company. And I literally was just stopped in my tracks. I could not believe that I didn't know about her story in this famous company. Um, it made me angry that I didn't know that history, my history as a Black woman, as a Black person in ballet. Um, but it also made me feel like I had so much more to fight for, that I had a duty and responsibility to carry on um, you know, her, her journey, the opportunities she didn't get um, because of the color of her skin. She joined the Ballet Russe in 1955 as the first black woman, the only black woman to dance in that company. She rose quickly to the rank of soloist. Um, and as you said, you know, she experienced a lot of um, racism uh, when the company would tour through the South and her life was being threatened by the Ku Klux Klan. And, um, and you know, it was really putting the whole company at risk. And so eventually uh, they, her and the artistic director made the decision that it was time for her to leave. Um, Raven ended up moving to Amsterdam um, and dancing with the Dutch National Ballet for about 10 years and having a really full and rich career. But this is the journey of so many Black artists of her time, especially, that would have to go to Europe in order to have, have uh, a career or to have success. And um, Raven moved back to the States after her time in Amsterdam and could not get a job in any other classical company. And so much has not changed um, today. You know, I think about Michaela de Prince, who literally has done what Raven has done as a black dancer. Uh, she had to move to Amsterdam and join the Dutch National Ballet because a, a company here in America would not hire her um, until more recently. But this, you know, it's just important for me to share Raven's story. It's important for people to know her name and all the black ballerinas who have allowed for me to be in this position.
in part, this book is an homage to her. You mm -hmm. want the world to know her story, but you also take pains to list the names, to call out the names of all these black ballerinas who have preceded you and, and also those who continue to perform. Clearly that's important to you. Why is that so important to you? Yeah, you know, it's it's so, so much a part of what drew me to ballet um, was being a part of something bigger than me, being a part of an incredible history and lineage and tradition, um, and then finding out that Black people have had a huge impact on the ballet community and culture for so long. Um, it's so important for us to know our history as Black people, you know, that we're so often turned away or told that we don't belong in certain spaces or that it's not for us because you don't know your history or you don't uh you don't see yourself reflected and um our stories are often erased and and or not documented and that's been the case with so many black dancers and black women in particular and so i feel that it's my responsibility with the reach i have with the platforms that i have um, for people to hear me and see me um, for them to know that yes i'm the first black principal ballerina at abt but i am by no means the first black ballerina and the first black dancer and i wouldn't be here without all of the work of so many black dancers that have come before me and before we let you go there's another milestone or glass ceiling i'm not quite sure what to call it that you are trying to cross and that is returning to ballet after becoming a mother <laughs> so you have a beautiful little boy now yeah. to enrich your life and your husband's life. I mean, what what's next? I mean, how do you see your career at this point? Do you plan to go back to the stage? It's difficult to be a, a working woman, uh, a woman that uh, wants to have a family and then and then still be able to focus on her career. And it's it's extremely difficult as an athlete. I mean, you look at Serena Williams and and you know returning to tennis and and the difficulties of that and and you know the focus on your body, but ballerinas have been doing this for for generations and generations having babies going back on stage but we don't see all the work and and what it takes to the the dedication and commitment and so my, my plan is to be back on stage um by the fall winter of 2023 um I think I'll, I'll always dance in some capacity and I will forever be uh, a part of the ballet community, you know, whether it's through uh, speaking, uh, writing books, um, just advocating uh, for black dancers in ballet through my foundation, the Misty Copeland Foundation. Um, I will forever remain a part of ballet in some way. <laughs> Misty Copeland, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you so much for having me.